In this day and age, you only really hear of NVIDIA or ATI video chipsets, sometimes even Intel or Matrox. But as with most things, the landscape used to be far more varied. This is Chips and Technologies 64300 VGA card. Hello everyone, I'm High Treason and as you might have guessed, today we're going to have a look at a Chips and Technologies VGA card for the Visa Local Bus Interface. Um, yeah, I can't really do anything huge at the moment because reasons, but whatever, I'm not going to take the whole video up with that and I have nothing else to say on camera, so I guess we'll just get on with it pretty much straight away. If you've never heard of this one, then I'm not really surprised, nor have I. Made in 1994, the card uses the VLB interface, still relatively common in this time due to the number of 486 systems then in use. Whilst PCI Pentium systems were about to come down in price, it would take a while for there to be any real incentive to the consumer for parting with the additional cash versus buying a perfectly reasonable 486 with Visa Local Bus. Indeed, one would be able to get away with this for quite some time yet, and the money saved could go towards a sound card, optical media, or maybe even some additional RAM. But we've talked about this a few times. Relevant here is the video card. Graphics cards were, predictably, not entirely cheap, and you're kinda screwed because you need one. The high price was in part due to the cost of memory they used, and the technology used by the VGA chipset to access this memory. At this time there were still cards using VRAM, which was known for being faster but considerably more expensive than cards using DRAM. However by this stage cards using DRAM had pretty much displaced VRAM models as the advantages were now rather minimal, if not completely negated. This was achieved in several ways, for one thing the DRAM itself improved. Even as late as 1994, there were still low-cost cards on sale using banks of 4 and 8-bit DRAM DIP chips. Internally, these hadn't really changed since the 1980s and were quite slow. Also, as time has worn on, they seem more prone to breaking down with age for no apparent reason. It doesn't happen very often, but it certainly seems to happen more often than what came later. You can probably see why VRAM came in for a time, it was certainly better than these rows of DIP chips, but VGA chipsets implemented wider memory interfaces and in some cases fancy things such as interleaving to avoid the costs of using VRAM chips. Coupled with the new and improved 16-bit EDO DRAM chips, the future was looking pretty good for video cards. Things could only get better from here on out, and they did. A quick note on uh, VRAM, I'm not sure I actually own any cards that use it. Uh, when I say, you know, the DRAM of the time, well, there's the thing. VRAM kind of was like the DRAM of the time. It would probably be fast page memory. Uh, the real difference was that it had a second data port, I think it was read only, and it mapped the memory a little bit more intelligently because you know, destructive reads and shit like that. I, I don't really want to go into gross detail with that. I, I'm sure you can find it on the internet. I, I don't know whether things like that stuck around in later implementations. Uh, graphics cards aren't really my thing, as you know. To, to me, I just want to put them in and have them work. There's, uh, they're not something that I really fuss about that much, as long as it does what I want it to do, unless it's something really, really exotic, which... Well, maybe we'll come back to that some other time, but yeah, uh, that just gives you a rough idea. It's because of that second data port and more efficient mapping of the memory. Obviously, you could use it faster, but DRAM technology pretty much just caught up with it in no time at all. It, you know, it got a lot faster. I mean, the same was true for main memory in the system. It, it at least became capable of running faster, but it took motherboards a while to actually take advantage of that you know, with the leap from fast page to EDO, but again, that's a whole nother story, and you're probably well aware of that, the amount of times we've talked about 486s on this channel, you don't see any advantage to running EDO on those, but anyway, yeah, uh, back on point. Enter the S3 Trio, specifically the Trio 64, a graphics core that S3 would continue to use throughout the remainder of the 90s. 
This card featured a 64-bit memory interface and could use up to 2 megabytes of EDO RAM. You can probably see where the 64 in its name came from and why the Trio 32 was cheaper. In the latter guys it had half of the memory bus width and supported half as much RAM. You don't see those very often anymore, but they were a decent option if you were extremely frugal. Overall the 64 was probably the better value option of the two and well, I think it sold better. It was pin compatible though, so card makers really only needed to make one PCB and just glue either chip to it. Which is why occasionally you'll find a Trio 32 with unpopulated pads for an extra meg of RAM it would never be able to use. S3 managed to cut costs farther by integrating the RAM DAC and clock generator into the VGA chipset. Hence the name Trio. I think it's common knowledge by now that this is where the name came from, that they put all three things into a single chip. Essentially it's a single chip solution, except the bias and some glue logic. And when you think about it, it makes sense to have these external, for various reasons. The older Seng Labs ET4000 was still going strong, featuring a 32-bit memory interface and outdated three-piece design. With external RAM DAC and clock generators, it managed to stay in the race by interleaving memory access when two megabytes were installed. The chipset may have supported double this amount, but it was almost never implemented on any PCB, and no performance gain would likely be observed by installing as much. With no performance gain, its only offering would be increased resolutions that I'm fairly certain nobody would have really used. Computers of the time weren't really very good at that sort of thing. You could increase the resolution, but even if you had enough memory to do it at 24-bit colour depth, the computer would be so slow at this task that you'd probably end up having to lower it to 16 colours if you were going really extreme. Even 1024 by 768 on a mid-90s Pentium will usually have you drop the colour depth to 8-bit, or else performance issues will start to be observed. As with the ET4000, it was much the same story for other common vendors. Cirrus Logic had gotten the integration down like S3, but aiming for a lower price point, they stuck with a plain 32-bit memory interface at this time and wouldn't implement 64-bit for a little while. ATI released the Mac 64 to replace their Mac 32 at around the same time, and whilst it was 64-bit, initially it was a three-piece design. It seems almost certain that S3 and Cirrus cards were cheaper, because the older Mac 64 chips are quite uncommon, and really all you run into nowadays are things like the VT, which are a single chip design from substantially later, at least in technology time. Things were accelerating very quickly at this point, as we know. Notably, all of these chipsets were adding more and more acceleration features as time went on, squeezing yet more performance out of the system. If you found yourself with any of the cards mentioned in your 486 or early Pentium, you probably wouldn't have any good reason to replace them at any rate. Now at last, the Chips and Technologies card. Unusually for a new entry at this time, it featured both a 32-bit memory interface and no interleaving, but it was a single chip solution. It supports 2 megabytes of EDO DRAM, but strangely it has two sockets for the older DIP style DRAM. 256 kibibytes per socket, which is rather odd. The reasons for this are that CNT opted to dodge the disadvantages of the 32-bit memory interface and lack of interleaving by using these as cache. Supposedly this would work out cheaper. This cache could be used whilst the main DRAM was busy, and would speed things up. In theory. In fact, we know full well that CPUs make use of cache to speed things up, and we know just what effect it has. This only became more pronounced as time wore on, given early systems had no CPU cache whatsoever. You know, maybe CNT were onto something here, maybe this was the, the next logical step in the evolution of things. I'm not going to go into too much detail here, I seem to remember way back tech doing an experiment with a salary in a 386 which demonstrated how CPUs react to having cache quite well. I can see what CNT were going for with their VGA solution though. You'd think with the level of integration in the 64300 chipset, they'd also integrate the cache memory, but this would have been costly due to the price of memory, and it might not even have been compatible with their fabrication process, which I'd imagine was contracted to somebody else. By leaving the sockets empty, you could buy the card cheaper, 
but dip DRAM chips been somewhat dated by now, you'd be able to get them at a fairly reasonable price later on if you wanted them. I mean, let's be honest, it was fairly common to not populate the second megabyte of RAM on a card which supported two megabytes of RAM, so... Yeah, that figures. Megabytes, man, that word never sounds right to me. It is correct, apparently. Of course, we want to know how well this CNT card performs, and it doesn't do too badly without the cache chips. In fact, it comes in very close to the ET4000 that everybody seems to fight tooth and nail to get hold of, which I'm not sure is really required, matching this card in some tests. 3D Bench and PC Player are identical, and the Seng only marginally pulls ahead in Top Bench. Doom is as narrow as makes no difference. The Seng is faster, but, well, yeah, it's, it's by some fraction that you can basically just throw in the trash. It doesn't matter. The test system is my 486SX40, which performs pretty close to a 66 MHz system, so there is no Quirk benchmark, because there's no floating point unit. I don't think it matters, I think we know what would happen. It'll run like crap in either case. The ET4000 can use its memory much faster in speedsys at around 25 megs per second versus only 15 megs for the C&T. This isn't a totally accurate measurement that I've made, but well, it, it's close enough. Overall, it seems you wouldn't notice a difference in most applications, at least not in DOS. Finding Windows drivers for this Chips and Technologies card is proving to be pretty much impossible, and I'm not even sure what we could do to test it, as I think both cards would just perform adequately. I mean, what are we going to do at that point? There's just... Eh, I don't know. Let's install those cache chips and try again. We'll steal them from another video card. Yeah, I didn't screw up. This is 1990s technology at its finest. It does things like this. In fact, it's fairly typical, really. The advantage they claim to offer is nothing. Seriously, it's nothing. There's no improvement in any test whatsoever. The score's identical to not having the cache. It is working, or so it seems. Because the only place we do measure a change is in speedsys. We have 18 megs per second now, instead of 15. So, I'm not sure what the problem is here. I doubt it's the CPU been a bottleneck. I doubt it's my Visa Local bus. I don't have any weight states turned on. Perhaps you need a TSR loaded, but, well, as we're reading a boost in speed sys without one, I'm really doubtful, and I can't find any mention of such a thing in what little literature is available. Seriously, this thing barely exists. Good luck finding information about it. All I could really find for the most part, were magazine tests speaking about how the card will come out at some point in the future, and none saying when it did, or how it fared. Only what the magazine tests got with their evaluation boards. In fact, I'm sceptical this card ever made it to the market, because a very interesting string appears when you boot the card up. For evaluation use only. This card is almost certainly from a magazine, and wasn't meant for public sale. Perhaps they never got this feature to work satisfactorily, and never brought the card to market. Or if they did, it was in very limited numbers, and I'd be interested to know if a later buyer's version changed anything. It's possible they just hadn't finished implementing things yet, but I'm doubtful. A large part of me suspects that they might have just abandoned it. You see, the 64300 was not CNT's first video chipset, and it wouldn't be their last. Whilst they failed to make very much of a splash in the desktop market, they did quite well in the laptop space. Hence my suspicions that they might have just turned their back on this thing very quickly. My Satellite 410 CDT uses a 65550 VGA chipset, and other models were quite commonplace in Toshiba as well as other brands of laptop for a time. Intel would eventually purchase them, in part for their graphics division. Overall, it does seem C&T were better suited to the laptop graphics segment, and I wouldn't be at all surprised if they just turned their back on the desktop segment at this point, if they just abandoned it, threw their arms in the air, put all their resources over there. Wouldn't seem like an unwise decision, all things considered. So it's possible this thing just got left by the wayside. You know, I almost forgot, but when you look at the version number for that bias, the I in a bracket, that is very much like Toshiba's bias numbering scheme, like on the T3200SX. And, well, if we go back to the Chips and Technologies video, 
where I talked about the 386 CPU, that FPU package is almost certainly a Toshiba fabrication. Toshiba probably fabricated these chips for them, because C&T were a fabulous company. Probably had something to do with the bias, and now it all kind of makes sense why Toshiba satellites have C&T VGA controllers in them, doesn't it? Hmm. I have to admit, I do like this card, and it is fairly decent, but I, I'm not sure I feel comfortable saying it does what it claims to do. Technically it does, because we've measured the speed increase for the memory, which is what it claimed to do. But we don't really see a performance improvement. It's almost as if the VGA chipset isn't really capable of taking advantage of this faster memory access. Perhaps it would be a different story under Windows, but would you be able to tell when the card was likely fast enough anyway, without the cache? I'm really quite sceptical. Regardless, the card does have a home to go to, because it can do something that an ET4000 struggles with, and even S3 cards in many circumstances. It works in a 50 MHz system, so it will become a part of my DX50 whenever that finds a case to live in. Yeah, it exhibits no problems whatsoever at this clock speed. A lot of cards do. A quick word on that. I've had good luck with Cirrus Logic cards in 50 MHz VLB slots, so those are always a possible candidate if you don't have one of these C&T cards lying around, which, let's be honest, you probably don't, and there's not much in the way of practical reasons to earn one over its contemporaries. I wouldn't even have this one if it hadn't been relatively cheap. Still, of course, there are no guarantees with 50 MHz VLB. This speed was kind of never really official and more of a do-it-if-you-dar thing, as far as I can tell. So, if you are going to play with that, then maybe that's worth keeping in mind. Anyway, I'm going to go back to that annoying dork with the camera. Like, yeah, I'm done here. Yeah, I'm sorry this was, like, pretty compact in the way it was made, but as things are at the moment, I can't really do a particularly large project. You know, I've been harassed by the council. I've done nothing for, like, the last month, really, because all I've had to do is run around after them, and it's very annoying. You know, they seem to be under the impression I'm violating something in my tenancy, which they've been twice now and established I'm not, and they're coming back again if they keep doing it, I'm probably going to try and complain about it, because it's, it's really getting on my nerves, to be honest. Uh, there's that, and I've got problems with my fucking workstation, because every time Windows updates, it, it gets worse. The performance is just worsened every time, to the point that encoding videos is about as slow as it was on my old Prezla now. I mean, my Prezla was quick in its time, but we're talking 2005. We're nearly at the end of 2019, which is fucking scary. And um, yeah, I'm sort of back at that level. It's just like, did I really need to fucking upgrade? I might as well have just stayed where I was. I've got no sound because Supermicro never bothered to patch out a bug that's on my motherboard, which I'm very surprised at. And Windows now seems to insist on just fucking with UEFI and setting it to HD audio mode. But the jack detection's reversed, so it mutes as soon as you plug anything in. Which means my sound has to come out of my Samsung fucking Gurmic Connect that I use for live streams, and it's not very good at that. A lot of things don't work with it. Uh, the other thing is these updates have made Vegas really prone to crashing. I'm I'm kind of screwed on this because I'm like I'm gonna probably gonna have to get a new workstation next year, but I don't want to. That thing should have years left in it. I mean I have to do something next year because my hard drives will be going out of warranty soon, and WDREs, as good as they are, once the warranties of they mass fail. I've had it happen again, I had a NAS, I made the mistake of using old drives, they went out of warranty, and yeah, all four of them just packed up within minutes of each other, and it's just like what happened to the Presler, you know, luckily that was after I decommissioned it, so it didn't matter, and so you know the workstation will go the same way. And now I don't have a NAS, so that's my last copy of everything until I get the NAS going again. And, yeah, you know, I might not go with Intel this time. I've heard AMD chips are sort of immune to this problem, and so we're going to have to look into that. It might be on AMD for the first time in a very long time, almost 20 years, I guess, by the time it gets built. We'll see. They're... they're, they're CPUs don't look too bad to me at the moment, but the motherboards for them look pretty crap, as usual. 
it's just a shame that hasn't changed. We'll, we'll have to see what's available. I'm not putting too much research into it now, and I don't have time because I'm too busy dicking around with this council shit. Uh, it's really annoying, man. I mean, I'm not worried about it, you know. I, I think the the goal is probably to try and get me out of council housing. They've made it clear a good while ago they don't really want me in council housing, but, well, they can't really just throw me out if I'm not doing anything, so... Yeah, I mean, I'm supposed to get rid of my keyboard stand and shit from what I understand is they're expecting me to, but there's nothing in my tenancy about it, so it's tough shit. They're just going to have to deal with the fact that I will put my stuff in my house, even though my house is shit. It's like, you're going to complain at me the house is shit, you're the ones who fucking put me here. I didn't want to move here, you know, but <laughs> whatever. That's, that's the way things are right now. It's... Uh, They'll get bored. They'll get fucking bored. So, like I say, we just live with it, but I, I can't be dragging shit out. Cause I, if I, it just gives them ammunition. If I'm in the middle of working on something and I've got cables running everywhere, like when I did that thin net video, you know they're just going to whine at me. They're like, this is a fire hazard, this is this, this is that. And that's, it gives them grounds to fucking come back and whine at me more. And I just don't need that. I just want to fucking get them bored, basically. Make them bored. Or make it to a point where I can fire complaints for harassment because it's it's just pissing me off, and I just want them to go away. Uh, it's uh, yeah, uh, irritating. But like I said, it, it'll go away. I'm sure it'll go away. And I, I would like to try and get another video done before this month is over, assuming I can edit this one at all because of the stability issues that I talked about. So yeah, I really should go and do that because the longer the video project, the worse it's going to fucking be. So well. Thanks for sticking with me whilst I rant and complain about things. You can probably tell what sort of place I'm in. I think there's no humour at all in this video. <laughs> that sucks. I apologise, but that's... You know, I can't force shit and whatever. Uh, at least it's informative. And uh, it was still fun to work on. So <laughs> it was fun to just do something that wasn't just fucking sitting there with fucking problems to go away. But yeah... Anyways, I'm out of here. Hopefully I will see you again soon. Hopefully this shit goes away. And hopefully the work station is at least somewhat fucking stable. But good God is it fucking slow. And it, it infuriates me. And it, like I say, it's, it's more annoying because it's not that the hardware sucks. It's because the software that it runs, the goddamn operating system, is just trash when it updates. And, you know, the, the only hardware problem is just a, a tiny jerk detection bug that the motherboard manufacturer never fixed. And that does disappoint me, unfortunately, but, well, that's the way it is, and that's what we'll have to fucking deal with. So I'm High Treason, thanks for watching, and as always, remember, don't be a screw-up. Load DOS 6.2 it, because it doesn't have automatic updates, and it'll run just as well fucking three or four years after the fact as it did the day you installed it, unless you fuck it up yourself. So that's something to keep in mind. Somebody asked me what the uh, cage was about last time. Don't eat my ears. Don't eat my eye. You. Get here. Probably don't like the light very much because it's quite intense. Oi. Tiff. Tiff. Oi. I'm not pulling it, don't worry. I'm just trying to get her attention. Oi. Yeah, I got rats. That's why. Go on. Fuck off then. Good girl.